My feet have always been a problem. Well, ever since I came to the islands, that is. Or oh, not when I was a boy in Belgium. No, I was as good on my feet as anybody in those days, running around the countryside, helping out on the farm, driving the cows in at night, skating on the river dial. <laughs> Why, the night before I left home for good, I walked 14 miles to say goodbye to my mother at the Shrine of Our Lady. 12 years. I promised her. This studio at PBS Hawaii has been the scene of many wonderful productions, from music specials, educational and informational programs, to shows about the arts. Our cameras have captured them all. But in 1976, over a series of several days, a high watermark in local television was set. Journey with us to that time as we look back on the career of actor Terrence Knapp, here on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. In this edition of Long Story Short, you'll meet a man who is considered by many to be a cultural treasure of Hawaii, a devoted teacher of the dramatic arts who chose to relocate from the British Isles of Shakespeare to an island home of a very different kind. An actor who has performed with Sir Laurence Olivier in the National Theatre of Great Britain and who mentored Booga Booga's James Grant Benton. Now that's quite a range. Join us as we take you from the King's English to Pigeon English with actor, director, professor, Terence Knapp. Did you grow up in an august theatrical family? No. I grew up the oldest of a family of seven. Uh, I had only sisters. I was the only boy. I was the eldest. And my mother... You sound like you were spoiled by seven younger sisters. Spoiled my eye. <laughs> I did the spoiling of them, if anything, uh -huh. right? Because my father, of course, was in the British Army practically all of my young life until I was about 15. And my mother, this is during World War II, 1939 to 1945, and we were forcibly evacuated from London in 1940 into a Welsh mining village which had no running water, no electricity, blah, blah, blah. My mother got fed up with that and managed to get us over to Dublin by boat but things were just as bad there because there was no rationing, you see. In Britain, during the war, everybody got a fair share, even though it was only that much, right? And my mother's great advantage was that even children were given an allowance of tea, tea leaves, right? Two ounces a week, something like that. Well, she could barter for all kinds of things because we children didn't drink tea much. Water would do mm -hmm. or milk, yeah? What could you get for the tea leaves? Well, she could uh, canned food, for example, uh, and, uh, uh, or people who had an allotment and grew their own vegetables, right? She, it was, you just mm -hmm. kind of, whatever they wanted, you know, if she had something to offer, then, and it was tea. The, the British liked their tea. Did you go hungry sometimes? I don't remember being hungry, but I do think it, it was the fittest generation that was ever grew up in the United Kingdom. Yeah, I was seven when the war broke out. I was 15 when it was all over, as it were. I was a very healthy youngster without an ounce of fat on me, if you follow me. And I think that was true practically of the whole population. Uh, in 1945, when the war came to an end, all the young men who had been taken from the school masters, yeah, returned. So there was a wonderful new energy at the Anglican Grammar School that I won a scholarship to. The parish priest was very annoyed that I was then going to go to a non-Catholic high-level school. But uh, my mother said no, she wanted me to take the opportunity because it was given within a kind of education area, if you follow me, and she knew that I'd get enough of a Catholic upbringing with her and my sisters at home. So I was very lucky. A 300-year-old Anglican grammar school with a marvelous tradition of uh, excellent teaching, especially of literature, and that turned me on. I had always been an enthusiastic reader of my own accord, and I used to go to the public library and 
look for books and in the Count of Monte Cristo or whatever it might be, and if I enjoyed it within a year, I probably reread it, yeah. There was no television in those days, none at all, but there was a wonderful BBC radio service, and one of the things they did were short plays and stories and that kind of thing, so there was much to educate and inform as well as entertain. How did you qualify for that scholarship? Um, I had to... Uh, well, I, actually what happened was we did a play at the uh, at school at Macbeth, and I was cast as Lady Macbeth. You were cast as Lady Macbeth. Yeah. Were there girls in the play? No, no girls in the school. No girls in the school. Okay. So and, how did how did you how did you be the one to get the lady? Might I remind you that in Shakespeare's time, when he wrote the plays, there were no women in the theatre at all, apart from tarts. All right. All right. Point taken. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you feel about playing the role? I didn't have to worry about it because she came and haunted me at night. And, and I don't mean in a frightening way, she just came to me. In other words, as I became more familiar with the text and with the situation of the play itself, she formulated herself in my imagination. And then because nobody interfered with me and my natural response, right, apparently I knocked them for six. Wow. And the headmaster, the classics master, immediately uh, told the Board of Governors that I should be given a scholarship to, uh, or to at least to audition for the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, which I did. And I was accepted and I got the scholarship. But I just had such a jolly time pretending, using my imagination. Did you ever have trouble, did you ever pretend in real life to get through situations? Yeah. For example? Going into the Royal Air Force. I didn't know what I was letting myself in for. So I went through the three month training period, an intake of 1,200 young men, boys of my age, 18 or so. And I passed out as best recruit of the entire wing, and I was offered a commission because I pretended I was somebody like Richard Todd. Do you know who I mean, Richard I Todd? I don't know who Richard a Todd. A soldier in, in a film, you know. And I, yeah, I just pretended to be somebody else, and uh, that's how it worked, yeah. In 1978, the PBS Hawaii production of Damien won top national honors, including the coveted Peabody Award. But it might surprise you to learn that Dr. Terence Knapp discovered Father Damien not in the 1970s in Hawaii, but in the middle of World War II in a little Victorian chapel in a borough of London called Hackney. And, and uh, that's where you heard of Damien? Yes, in this so, church? I'm sorry, at the back of the church there was a, a magazine rack, uh, a little book that people paid uh, the equivalent of 50 cents to buy and go and read about this, that or the other. Well, I read every pamphlet <laughs> because in between masses sure. waiting. And I was fascinated by this character, Damien, yeah? And, He's uh, Belgium, Belgian rather. So what, yeah, what did Flanders, you relate to? Flanders, right. <laughs> So I absorbed the story uh, for myself. In fact, I still have that two-penny booklet. Do you really? Yeah. I should have brought it with me to show you, but I... Um, and he, he... So he was part of my psyche, in a sense, because I'd read about him so much. Well, uh, and what did the story tell you about him? What did you know at that young age? Uh, that he was uh, a man of very little education, who was filled with the idea of loving God through other people and not minding doing the dirty work because he was used to doing it when the pigs and the cows and all that kind of stuff, yeah. And he wasn't, he wasn't in any sense really educated, you know. And he had, he had a brother, Pamphil, who decided he was going to be a priest, an older brother. So he went off to be trained as a priest. And Jeff, Jeff de Verster, later to be Damien, he thought he'd like to be a priest too. <laughs> so he went trotting after his brother. 
and then his brother was ordained, but fell sick, something like the chicken pox, right? And he could not go by boat to the Sandwich Islands, as was arranged. So the uh, head honcho in Belgium said to Jeff de Verster, later to be Father Damien, well, you take your brother's place. And he said, yeah, all right, yeah, and he went. And when he arrived, the French bishop who was here uh, said, uh, you're not even a priest? And he said, no, not yet. So the bishop ordained him and then sent him to Hilo to build a church and Catholicize the community. And that's how he, that's how he got going. It's a remarkable story, really, because he wasn't to know that he had anything like the capacities that he exhibited as the years went by. But I think the simple answer is that he, he's, he's a man of the soil, you know? There's no pretension about him. He never pretended to be anything other than he was, which is really a simple, God-fearing, young man who wanted to be of help to other people. And then when I went to talk to uh, Aldous Morris about doing something for the Bicentennial, and uh, I mean, I knew that Damien was the patron saint of Hawaii, as it were. There was this Marisol statue that I'd also seen in Washington earlier. So we wrote a multi-character play about him. And then I thought, well, we should develop this more because he is, he, he's part of Hawaii in an extraordinary way. Anyway, I thought it'd be a lovely pl part to play. <laughs> <laughs> and you were, you were talking right to the camera in this studio yeah, yeah, all yeah, those years yeah, ago. Yeah. Wade Kuvion was the cameraman. And yeah, he, right. he said he felt you were playing right to him. I did. I did, because I wanted a pair of eyes, yeah. And he was on a crane, as you probably know better than I do. And so when he would come in for a close-up, yeah, I would look, as it were, past the lens into his face. And I enjoyed it. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. It really was. The University of Hawaii at Manoa was to be Professor Terence Knapp's home for a long career, where he taught and mentored generations of up-and-coming actors. It was also the site of a most unlikely pairing, the works of Shakespeare and the local comedy group Booga Booga. I had met um, David Friend, who knew Dr. Ernst, who was the founder of Kennedy Theater, and I had tea with Dr. Ernst in Japan, and he said, when you come to Honolulu next, please let me know. So I did. And the first thing I saw at Kennedy Theatre was called the Majest... You know, Russian play. Russian play, comedy, translated. And I, I simply could not believe 600 people sitting in that wonderful auditorium having such a good time in, in enjoying the play. Then I trotted back to England in due course. Then I got a letter, a letter from Dr. Ernst to say, would I, would I be interested in coming out and being a guest director? And I thought I would like it. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he wanted an English season. We were going to do the importance of being earnest, uh, Shakespeare's Scottish play, Macbeth, and then... You didn't play Lady Macbeth, though, no, right? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, Hay Fever, Hay Fever by Noel Card, a lovely threesome. And um, I enjoyed it. And Joel Trafido, who was the vice chairman at the time, came and said, are you enjoying yourself? And I said, yes. He said, do you like it here? And I said, yes. He said, would you like to stay? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's I nice and neat, isn't it? I didn't have to apply for the job. It was offered to me. So, and so along the way, 35 years with the University of Hawaii at Manoa, you, you taught students in acting. Yes. What, uh, you must have seen all kinds of ranges of raw talent. What was the most needed thing for these students? There was a man called Jim Benton, who was one of my earliest students. Yeah. And it was through him that something like Kumo Kohua came into That's being. That's James Grant Benton. That's right. 
as he later became. He was, <laughs> he was Jim Benton, right? And there was a knock on my door, and I'd been there only for about a year or so, and he put his head, uh, rather, in this man, put his head and said, hey, you Shakespeare Waller or what? <laughs> And I said, how dare you? <laughs> it was Jim. He came in. We became buddies very quickly. And um, he said, could, could, we, could I uh, help him understand Shakespeare? And I said, yes, you can register as a student and take classes, can't you? He said he couldn't afford to do that. So I said, well, if you like, we'll have some Shakespeare readings in my office. And he came and brought, you know, the booger booger lot. <laughs> That's an interesting and, assortment of people and, in your office. And, that high, and they were sitting on the floor. There must have been 15 people in there, as well as on the sofa. And, and what and attracted stand. you to do that? Because you didn't have to do that. His, his, his delightful personality as much mm -hmm. as anything else. And um, a kind of cheerful Charlie quality about him, which I liked enormously. And so we read Twelfth Night, OK? Blow me down if just something like two or three weeks later on my door, he walks in, he's got papers in his hand, he has rewritten Shakespeare's Twelfth Night into Pigeon. And how, what was your reaction to that? Could have been very negative. No, I loved it. He loved I, it. I mean, well, I, I, I was enchanted by Jim himself. I thought he was such a delightful spirit. And um, he was mad about performing and comedy as I am, if you know what I mean. And um, so I, uh, we read it. I, I got a cast. Uh, the people were wetting themselves with laughter. They really were. So I decided to stage it in the lab theater because the main stage season was already you know, set up. And they were hammering on the doors to get in. Then we became, as it were, bosom friends, and I decided to, we, in the lab theater we did it, they liked it. Then we took it out to one of the community colleges, which has a big, big auditorium, about six, seven hundred. Leeward community? Leeward. Leeward. Mm -hmm. The walls were shaking. The walls were shaking with delight here. Yeah. So that was simply a lovely thing to have What a great cross-cultural mix. Well, yes, it was. And, and, and me, with my great love and respect for Shakespeare itself, right, it was simply a matter of idiomatically transferring that into this other gorgeous language, right? Pidgin, of course, it's English with Hawaiian flavor. But it was great fun. It was great fun. The same man who enjoyed watching the locals rolling with laughter in the theater at Leeward Community College has certainly seen it all. In his long career, Dr. Terence Knapp can count among his friends and colleagues some of the most distinguished actors that Great Britain has ever produced. And he knows a thing or two about taking a show on the road. Well, there's... Laurence Olivier, for a start. <laughs> the Lord Olivier of Brighthamstone, as he was. He be became a peer and sat in the House of Lords on behalf of the theatre arts. Um, I was with him for almost four years in his company. Uh, he was founding a, a company at the, in Chichester in the south of England, a beautiful uh, theatre like the one in Canada. Uh, open stage, uh, and I auditioned for him. I was taken into the company, and then when he founded the National Theatre, later to be the Royal National Theatre, he invited me. Um, one of the, the greatest joys of my life was playing Osric in Hamlet with Peter O'Toole as Hamlet and Rosemary. Uh, her name fails me momentarily, but it 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 was a stunning, stunning cast, right? And he had me play Osric as the kind of uh, runabout boy at the court of the king, right? So I was often to be seen doing this or the outer, offering the queen a handkerchief at enormous fun. And uh, I was well noticed in it, in the production. Uh, and uh, Lyle was very pleased with me. What did the critics say about you? 
But they just said I was kind of a quicksilver. Uh, and that was the one word that I was very flattered. You know, light on my feet and kind of, I mean, Hamlet doesn't like Osric for those reasons. He's like an annoying fly, right? But uh, I enjoyed myself enormously. Judy Dench, you knew, hmm? you know Judy, Judy Dench, Oh, right? Judy, I know. Well, Judy and I were part of a British Council touring company to West Africa. Now, this is one of the most exciting things that ever happened to me in my life. We played out of doors, usually, to audiences in Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. And on one occasion, we were playing to two and a half thousand people sitting on the uh, southern edge of the Sahara. Um, because it was so dry, the acoustics was perfect. And as I was saying, I was playing Festi, and I had a trio of musicians who would give me the note, and I'd go. And on this particular occasion, uh, I got the note, and I sang, but they weren't accompanying me. And we got off, or they were... I said, what's the matter with you? And they said, you, you took the wrong key. I said, I did not. <laughs> I said, I took the one you gave me. Apparently what happened was there was a train whistle 12 miles away, which went beep, and it traveled all that distance, and I took that as the... <laughs> That's quite a memory, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and Judy and I uh, uh, became chums because she liked uh, to uh, paddle around in the swimming pools, right? And um, so we formed an aqua ballet. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very hot, you know, the, all together in the Sahara. Uh, but we had such a lot of fun. And then two years later, um, I was invited to do a similar tour of Southeast Asia. And I was looking forward to being with Judy again, but for whatever reason, she wasn't able to do it. But by then, we'd become fast friends, right? And so I see her when I go back to England, and her daughter, Finty, and her uh, grandson, Sam, you know, and I knew her husband, Michael Williams, very well. Uh, he sad sadly died of lung cancer after only about 10 years. But there was a closeness and a conviviality and a, and a liking. In the 1970s and 80s, Hawaii was a hotbed of television production, and the industry needed the best of Hawaii's acting talent to line its casting sheets. Although he filled his share of guest slots, Dr. Terrence Knapp might hope you might forget some of his appearances on the small screen. What do you think about acting in that venue? Do you enjoy that? Not much. Not much. Because it's trivial. The scripts are trivial. What did um, you play in Hawaii Five-O? Oh, um, um, kind of middle-aged English twerp. <laughs> you know, they, they fully suited of ties and so on, uh, visiting something or another. I did do one, there, there was, uh, I forgot what it was called, something Hawaii, and I was cast as an attorney and I had to do something like a 12-minute speech. And I knew that I probably would have a hard time rem memorizing it with certainty, do you follow me? So I asked the director if he would uh, put it on the thing and I would read it off. And he was very dubious. And I said, well, this way I won't falter. I can time it according to, all right, he said one take, and I got a standing ovation from the entire set when I wanted it done, because I was so relaxed, I didn't have to try to remember. I could just, and then I said, my mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, the Twelfth Night in Pigeon, that never, that never rubbed off on your speech. You, and well, and, and, and I, after how many years in Hawaii, more than 30, yeah, well, you still have your If English I want, I could do good accent? imitation, sort of, yeah. I can slur. <laughs> I don't have the vocabulary. That's, I mean, that's what gives the Hawaiian dialectal forms such, 
such joy, their, their version of certain words, right, and the way they're used. Oh, I've been a very lucky man. Hawaii's world-class actor, Dr. Terence Knapp, a man who's rubbed shoulders with English lords and UH Manoa undergrads, who made a huge contribution to the legacy of this TV station, PBS Hawaii, with his performance in Damien, continues to live in Honolulu in retirement. As Professor Emeritus of Theater, he spends his time traveling, mentoring students, and occasionally performing. For Long Story Short and PBS Hawaii, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. As the eldest of seven kids, mm. the rest of whom were girls, yeah. what can you share with us about growing up with girls? What kind of insights can you tell us? You learn to be very patient for a start. Right? <laughs> you, you never got to use the bathroom for any length of time, I bet. No, no, I don't remember that, but I, uh, I, uh, my, the, the, three, the three elder sisters, as it were, Sheila, Eileen, and Patsy, were only about a year apart, right? So they were almost like triplets, in fact. Uh, and I remember them um, sometimes losing their temper when they're little girls and pulling each other's hair and uh, for no good reason that I could think of. And uh, uh, my mother told me never to interfere. <laughs> <laughs> she said, just let them do it. 